speaker is Marcin Gozdalik. He is a programmer, team leader, and agile practitioner working for Nine Lives Data. Marcin is working on a Python-based product that indexes billions of files. Marcin will talk about packaging and deploying Python code in difficult conditions. Shipping Python code to customers, Marcin Gozdalik. Uh, Hi, um, my name is Marcin Gosdal. You can find me on the internet with Gosdal. Uh, whenever, wherever, whatever services, I'm Gosdal at something, or the Twitter is the other way around. I work um, for a Warsaw-based company called Nine Lives Data, which does a few things, and I want to tell you two stories, or two and a half story, um, about deploying. Python code um, in two projects that uh, Nine Lives Data was working on. So uh, the first story will be about deploying uh, Python code for uh, for Japanese working for a Japanese company called NEC, um, and which uh, which is a client of Nine Lives Data. And the second one is about deploying the code for customers of the Starfish storage project. Um, uh, as Tomek mentioned, Starfish is trying to index uh, petabytes and billions of files. So I hope this falls into the big data category, or so I think. Um, so um, yeah, if you want to talk about storage and stuff like that after the talk, so. Um, I'm pretty uh, happy to talk about this. So our, my primary motivation uh, to dig into uh, the, w the rabbit hole uh, called deploying Python was um, a mess left, on a, uh, left by the previous developer of some internal uh, QA uh, application that it was a web application written in Django but it was deployed in a really messy way. There were some like uh, shared objects, else LD library path somewhere to TMP somewhere, and it took a lot of time to just untangle it. Um, so uh, the first step was to put everything in the source revision control in Git, and the second step was try to deploy it. And um, my talk is actually about uh, if the one of the previous talks was about modern deployments. Here uh, I have uh, actually ancient deployments because, yeah, um, shipping Python is supposed to be a solved problem. You pack it into a container, um, you uh, ship it, and magic happens, then you profit. There's all this new stuff called Docker, Kubernetes, CoreOS. Um, everything, this, those new beautiful technologies. So um, with, I like this idea of voting by clapping. So how many of you can actually deploy your code using all those new uh, hot technologies? <laughs> Just a few. So uh, yeah, uh, that makes me a little bit more comfortable because I'm not alone. So. Um, yeah, that that was the uh, that was the um, situation we were in. Um, this code was to be deployed on Red Hat Five ser server without access to the internet. Uh, only thing we had was a flaky SSH connection because it was going through all the hops and proxies because of all the internal security uh, at the Japanese company. Well, that's that's their policy, and we we needed to uh, to make it run. So we needed to find a way to um, to deploy the uh, Django app with all the different requirements, um, so that the intern we don't use access to internet. Um, we depend on minimal number of things, so that. Uh, minimal number of things can break, um, mean, meaning py the Python itself or the libraries, and we wanted to deploy fast. So, well, I thought, 
well, I'll Google it and I'll find a solution and the next day I'll be done and I will be doing something else. It turned out that it was a much deeper rabbit hole than I suspected uh, because pretty much every piece of documentation or, um, or a blog post or how to uh, assu just assumes that you have internet, right? This is 2004, it was 2013, I think, but it was 21st century, we have internet, right? Not always. Um, so I couldn't find uh, a way to do this. Uh, well, I couldn't find a way somebody already uh, did it. Uh, so we started working on our, our own solution. So the first solution to, to uh, this task of deploying Django app to an internet without internet access was to use pip install, uh, downloading the, uh, all the requirements uh, for the project, um, and using a pip2py tool. This dear2py uh, dear invocation is a part of pip2py. So the first command uh, downloads uh, all, the, uh, all the requirements, well, the, there is something missing you need, minus error, but I just didn't want to clutter the slide. Um, need, we need to download the, um, all the requirements for our application. Um, there is a mysterious no-use wheel, which is quite a new thing, I think. Um, it's PEP 427 merged two years ago, and apparently wheels uh, should uh, make it easier to deploy by, uh, Python, and this is like binary-like uh, way to distribute Python code. Uh, for example, you have pre-compiled external modules, well, the C modules in, um, in those wheels. But, well, it wouldn't work for us because we were working on some kind of local Ubuntu machines and um, the uh, what was downloaded for and worked for local Ubuntu didn't work for uh, Red Hat 5. So we need to disable these and download the source and uh, convert all those downloaded, downloaded tar GZs into something that pip likes, and that's the dear to pi part. It converts a directory of tar GZs, which are source distributions, into a something that pip can use as a source to install from. So uh, on the remote server, um, we just rsynced all of the code and rsynced the, um, the requirements in source distribution format, and then used, uh, activated the, uh, or created a virtual env and installed um, requirements from the directory that was created by dear2py, and this is this packages simple uh, directory. Um, and it kinda worked. Um, Sometimes when something went wrong, for example, something didn't get downloaded and it wasn't present on the remote machine, it still tried to access the internet for some reason. Basically, there is no pip installed from this directory only and do not try to access internet uh, because, well, authors of pips assume that you always have internet. Um, so we solved some problems with, with this idea. No internet access was needed. Um, and virtual env separated the environment for the application from the host packages. And we actually, after a quite substantial amount of work, I don't remember how long it took, but after some time uh, we were able to deploy the application, reload the HTTP server, and everything worked. And it was fun. But uh, it, it solved the problem but it didn't solve every problem you might have uh, because you still need to have like compatible Python version on the remote machine. So we uh, basically uh, downloaded and installed Python 2.6 from sources on this Red Hat 5 machine, I think. Um, you still need a working C compiler for the Python uh, modules that uh, have some uh, C code in them that needs to be compiled. Um, and it's, it takes quite a long time because you need to fetch all the packages. So then we learned about the devpy 
uh, tool which uh, just caches the, uh, uh, you can cre easily create a local cache of uh, packages, of PyPI packages, uh, so that you don't download them over and over again. So this was the first story, quite the easier part of deploying a uh, Django web app to a server without internet connection. And then I moved in the organization to work on the uh, Starfish project. And here, this Starfish software is like an old style uh, software sold to enterprise customers, uh, like think big universities, the top 10 universities in the world, or the big pharma, all the uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, on this planet. There are not that many of them. Um, and the reality is that enterprise uses Red Hat 6. They are just starting the migration to Red Hat 7. They might use Solaris. Um, and sometimes uh, they even use Windows, but we are not yet. We haven't yet solved this problem. Basically, we don't yet run uh, on Windows. Um, so, um, yeah, that that was our um, that was my second problem to solve: how to ship Py um, Python code uh, to a customer. Uh, so, well, what everybody does is that. When you, yeah, I already had a hammer, so the new problem looked like a nail. So I thought I could do the same, basically. So um, download all the requirements of my code um, and put it into a package like targz package and give the user a script that will create the virtual environment and will install all the um, um, all the requirements. So this is the Hammer approach. You take the Python code, uh, you take the requirements, you put it into RPM, and create a, and write a post install script that will create a virtual env and install all the requirements in your code into one um, one place. Um, you also need to create some kind of wrappers that will activate the proper. Uh, virtual env um, and just execute appropriate Python module. So we tried this and it kind of worked. Um, and it had the great virtue of being really, really fast. So those RPMs were built pretty quickly. Um, but then the uh, late in the, in the development, our mm, client came to us and said, hey guys, you know what? I don't really want to ship my um, Python source code to, the cu to my customers. Can you obfuscate it a little bit? So again, what we did is we Google it, and there is um, 100,000 results in Google for obfuscate Python code. So obviously, people find this, well, uh, encounter this problem. But there is, there is a few tools that do uh, Python code or Python bytecode obfuscation. But um, actually, we couldn't find any tool that will uh, generate some packages from uh, Python source code and allow you to ship it. So, um, but what we find find out what we found out by googling is that well, Dropbox had the same idea and used uh, and used some approach. So, um, I don't know if you knew. Well, I learned this by googling that. Uh, in 2013, the Dropbox client worked like this, that you had, that they've written it all in Python, uh, they obfuscated uh, the Python code, they actually obfuscated the Python bytecode, so they swapped the, um, uh, um, the opcodes, so assuming, I don't know, the opcode for adding two numbers is five, so in uh, on a uh, Dropbox uh, Python interpreter, it's not five, it's 75 or whatever. So they uh, obfuscated it. Uh, and the exit that you get uh, on your client, on, on your desktop, is basically a Python interpreter and bundled with all this uh, uh, obfuscated, obfuscated bytecode. And our sources uh, in Dropbox, uh, assume that it's still true. That's how the uh, 
Dropbox binary, client binary is still shipped. Um, and actually, some people um, in 2013 wrote a paper on some Usenic conference on how to get this Python source code back, how to remap all those opcodes to their normal state and read the uh, Dropbox uh, source code again. Dropbox also, well, hired Guido Van Rossum. Maybe uh, they thought that deploying Python is uh, hard enough and maybe we can hire Guido and he'll ha help us. Um, so since Guido was unavailable, we had to use plan B and think of something on our own. Um, so we Googled a little bit, find out a project called PineStaller. Um, we didn't, we didn't um, think really hard about whether to use PineStaller or some other stuff or maybe write some own stuff. Uh, one of the guys in the project had some experience with PineStaller and he said it works. So uh, PineStaller also um, advertised that it supports Solaris. So yeah, that's, that's why we said, well, it, it fits, it should work. So let's take PineStaller. So what is PineStaller? It takes your Python source code. It takes uh, all the requirements, well, I should say dependencies, and bundles it into one package. One package can be one folder that you can uh, create an archive from, or this package might be a one executable that is actually a self-extracting archive. So it just extracts into a temporary folder and runs from there. Um, so it uses some form of obfuscation, meaning if you look at this folder while the program is running, you will find some files, but if you just try the normal PYC decompiler, you won't get the source code. So uh, our uh, US customer says, well, okay, it's good enough for government work. And it, I learned this expression this day, um, and it was quite refreshing, and I felt a little bit better that our American friend, friends uh, think have the same attitude towards their government as we tend to have here. Um, so using PyInstaller solved some of our problems. So as I said, the, um, the archive for uh, the executable has the exact Python version that you used for, uh, for development. So I don't know what is your experience, but we are using um, multi-processing heavy um, computations and some logging. And it turns out that both 2.6 or two points earlier 2.7 versions have actually bugs. I don't know, it, it's appalling, but there are bugs in Python. Um, so we really needed to ship like the, new, the newest and greatest Python 2.7.9. Uh, because, uh, well, we were developing on Python 2, um, because uh, those bugs were fixed. So this is nice that you get this, uh, this package with a certain version of Python and you don't depend on whatever the end user will have on their server. Uh, there is a little bit of obfuscation and you all depend almost on uh, anything because um, the uh, C modules that are in uh, uh, C extensions that are in Python modules um, get they get bundled all together with all the other stuff into the archive. So um, the only thing, the only things that you d depend on is maybe the external executables that you might use, for example, rsync um, or Maybe you use the uh, MySQL library, libmysqls, or whatever. So yeah, those are the things you depend on. But apart from that, uh, everything is bundled. Mm. And we also found out that if we build the PyInstaller packet, well, the, uh, the archive using PyInstaller on Red Hat 6, it actually runs everywhere. So it runs on Red Hat 6, uh, Red Hat 7, or uh, Ubuntu 12, Ubuntu 14, Ubuntu 15, whatever. So, but um, there are some remaining problems that come from distributing your software, not as a service, but as a package that the uh, customer may install 
onto their own gear. So these are stuff like version management, also known as which version the customer is running, this bug should be already fixed. Um, upgrade scripts, so if you install a new version over the old version, you probably need to migrate the database or maybe you uh, need to uh, migrate some configuration file or something like that. Mm. You need some external dependencies like, for example, mm, I mentioned rsync. The software uses rsync for moving files from A to B and it just needs rsync so you can express this uh, well, you, you, can't express this, you can't express this dependency, dependency straight in your Python code. Um, you also need some configuration files and directory start, uh, structure uh, for the software to be running. Well, you get everything uh, from this list probably in your Docker container on whatever fancy stuff you're using, but when if, if, if you're trying to ship the software to your um, end customer on their own servers, you need to package it somehow. So our final solution uh, is to use PyInstaller to, um, to combine the Python code and requirements and put the other stuff like configuration, uh, configuration files or the etcnd startup scripts or some place to put logs or some place to store some data, whatever the data is, and to have some uh, post-install or pre-install or pre-move, whatever you, you name it, scripts, and put those into RPM or DEPS because RPMs and DEPS were designed to do just this. So RPM and DEPS are fine, but I don't know why. But whenever you come to a developer and says, well, maybe we'll do a, an RPM from, from this, they just run away screaming. Um, I don't know exactly why, but there is a trick that you might use. It's called FPM, Fing Package Manager. Um, and it's actually the easiest, way, the easiest way we could think of to create a uh, native package. It actually creates from, uh, from one recipe, you can create both. RPM, you can create Deb, you can create some Solaris packages, you can create uh, Mac app, actually. Didn't try it, but apparently you can do it. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's how we work. We, uh, we take the Pine Star and all the, and some uh, recipe to, uh, to build a package and use FPM to build it, actually. There are alternatives, but to Pine Installer, uh, we never researched any of it. Uh, most of them are pretty, ma pretty maintained, meaning they're not abandoned, apart from Py2 Exe, uh, BB3, Sex Freeze, and Py2 App, which is macOS only. Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe one of them uh, is also good and maybe has better obfuscation or whatever. But since Pine Installer works, we uh, we didn't. Uh, we didn't look further. There are obviously some downsides to using PyInstaller. So uh, Solaris support is deemed experimental, uh, and Python 3 support is deemed experimental, although Solaris support works for us, so maybe Python 3 support also works. Um, the build times are much, much longer than for the virtual and uh, RPMs I've described you. Uh, so actually for development, we still do those um, virtual and RPMs because they are so much faster to build. Uh, the executable, our software contains of like tens of executables. So we have like this um, nice looking big RPM so that the customer knows what he pays for. Uh, because ba even if you have like a very simple main uh, print hello world, it just gonna package all of the uh, Python nested lib and uh, and um, yeah the Python uh, Python uh, executable. There may be some patches uh, required. The demonizing might be tricky, and we couldn't get it to work with modules requiring FFI. So what else can you do? Well, there are two projects that we w we played with one of them, Cython. Uh, we didn't play with Mwitka. I uh, have no idea how you pronounce it, how it's the, the, this, the, the right way. Um, 
So uh, we learned about Cyton, and if you go to Cyton website, it just tells you that it makes writing C extensions for Python as easy as Python itself. And if you read it, you just go away because we don't write any C extensions. But uh, there is about Nuitka, we skip about Nuitka, but Cyton has a secret life to it because it's, it is an optimizing static compiler for both Python programming language and the extended Cyton programming language. So what it means that you can take your uh, vanilla Python code and compile it actually uh, to C code, which maybe uh, you might want to do it for two reasons. One reason is obfuscation, and the second reason is speed. So um, that's how it looks like. Uh, yeah, but I have the, uh, have the order wrong. So this is, uh, well, because every uh, benchmark needs to have Fibonacci because it's like the most skewed be benchmark ever. Um, this is the Python code for, Fibon for computing uh, nth Fibonacci number. And this is the Cython code with, uh, type, uh, with types added because uh, you can compile this code in Cython but you also can add um, types to your vari variables and ask, uh, and ask Cython to compile it. And because I have the uh, slides in the wrong order, I just wanted to show you that it's quite easy. The PYX is the file with, type, uh, added, with types added. You just write a setup pipe which looks like this, do a Python setup pipe build extension, and you get from 180 bytes of fib PYX, you get 70 kilobytes of C code. So if, you, uh, if you're really adventurous, you can see how the C code looks like. That's something like this. Uh, but actually, if, uh, if you look at the speed of the code, um, you might see that the speed up, the pure Python computation for 90th Fibonacci number takes this amount of time, and in pure C, it takes 78 times, uh, so it's 78 times faster, uh, and C Cython is 50 times faster. So it's actually pretty slick if you have some um, computation-heavy code. Uh, if, you, if we look at this uh, procedure again, uh, which has those type, uh, types added, and this is actually the, uh, the code for the inner, inner part of the loop, which is actually, uh, well, it's straight C code. You probably cannot do much better. So if you want to do it, you can add Cython to, uh, to your pipeline and get some speed up and uh, ultimate obfuscation for your code. So you basically will be shipping uh, executables uh, and not like packaged Python and something else. But this is like a, a uh, the, this half of the story because we didn't go this route yet. We just played with Cyton a little bit. And if you want to read a little bit more, uh, here is the paper and here is the comparison of different software to do uh, Python uh, deployment and freezing. Thank you. This is the time for the questions to Marcin. Um, the question would be about Cyton. Uh -huh. So when you actually convert your, your code into a Pyrex code and then convert it into a C code and then compile it, uh, do you need? Do you still need to use PyInstaller? Can you just uh, deliver the package in the normal C way? Um, the what uh, Cyton produces is a shared object library that can be loaded into Python interpreter. So what PyInstaller does, you, it can bundle Python interpreter with this C code, with this SO library. So actually, you can get like. Uh, what you will get if you compile all of your Python code, you will get 
uh, libpython so and different so files for different packages of, of your code, but you won't have any Python bytecode. And those shared objects uh, compiled by Cyclone will, will call libpython so. Thank you. Here. Uh, yeah, I also had uh, some experience uh, shipping with PyInstaller and ran into some troubles. I wanted to ask you if uh, you ever considered changing language. So what was the main motivation to keep Python? Um, external, ex well, customer wanted basically, and we are not, uh, we, we cannot question that right now. So it was given from outside. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Marcin Gozdalik. <laughs>